Hey guys, welcome back to The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own Twitch channel. Uh, we're here to provide homebrewing guidance and tips and equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Josh Ratliff. I'm a BJCP certified beer judge. Um, I'm also a brewmaster for Mr. Beer and the store manager for everything homebrew here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we have a special show for you today. It's probably going to be of great interest to a lot of you. I'm sure a lot of you have been pretty tired of uh, bottling your beer as it can get uh, tiring, especially with 12 ounce bottles and large batches like five gallons or higher. Um, so today we're going to show you how to keg your beer. Um, I'm gonna, there's a lot to go over, but I'm going to try to keep it condensed into an hour. Um, so I'm going to show you um, how to keg your beer, how to maintain your kegs, and I'm also going to show off a couple different draft systems and different options for draft systems, um, things like that. <coughs> and uh, welcome to, this, to the chat, guys. Now, let's get started. Um, we're going to be kegging uh, this, uh, this beer. You might want to move the camera a little bit. Well, that leaves that one too. Oh well. But um, this is uh, our fast ferment, um, uh, six point nine gallon, seven gallon uh, fermenter. Um, I did a. This was one of the first all grain uh, batches we did on the show, um, and it's pretty much done. I've already removed the trube a couple of times. So you turn the valve. And you remove your collection jar. Of course, it's going to drip a little bit. All right, most of that's just true. Um, there's a little bit of beer in there, but we'll take a loss on that. Okay, and we have a special... Uh, Filling hose. We've already pre-sanitized all this stuff for the sake of time. That's one thing I don't like about these fast fermenters is the uh, the angle of this thing. If they put like a joint on it so it can come out, you'll see what I mean. The hose kind of bends a little bit, but that's not a big dish, big issue. Okay, so we're going to be using, first I'm going to show off what we're using. Um, you may be more familiar, if you're a beginner into brewing, you'll probably be more familiar with these types of kegs. Um, of course, they come much bigger for like uh, your parties and things like that. You know, you go to college parties, house parties, and people always have kegs of their PBR or whatever. This is a Sankey keg. Um, this is a commercial keg. Uh, most home brewers will not be using these. They do take uh, special equipment to fill them up. Um, but I will show you what the, uh, the tap looks like for one of these. And so this is the tap for one of these guys. And it just goes on. You're probably, you may be more familiar with the pump kind, um, which are great for dispensing your beer at a party, but it just puts oxygen into your beer. So once that happens, you pretty much have to drink all that beer right away. Um, these you can hook up with CO2, so you can always have your beer on tap without worrying about it getting oxidized. I'm sure some of you guys have woken up drunk at the party or, you know, had a, had a keg left over from a couple days with your pony pump on there and it's just stale as all hell. Okay, so this is not what homebrewers use. This is a commercial keg. Um, what homebrewers use are actually soda kegs or were originally designed for soda. These are uh, known as Cornelius kegs, which is actually a brand, but now the, the name's kind of colloquial. You know, it's all the different kegs. They just refer to them as Cornelius or Corny kegs. Um, they have different mounts, a, a, a line out and a line in. So your gas in, your beer out. And it's got a, a lid. And then so the beer out, if you can see it, there's a, a tube that goes all the way down to the to the bottom of the keg so the uh the beer um fills from the from the bottom up it dispenses from the bottom up and when you're maintaining these um these come off uh there's gaskets in there you do have to replace all your gaskets every so often sometimes they might start to get a little little cracked or dry rotted Um, a lot of homebrew supply stores do have like uh, replacement kits that have all the gaskets in like one bag for like five bucks. 
Okay. And then, of course, for you don't have to have a five gallon keg. We also sell these uh, 2.5 gallon kegs on our website, and these are great for Mr. Beer Batches. Um, and they're super portable, so you can take them to parties and such. And I will show you some of that on the draft system with jockey boxes and things like that here in a moment. Um, I don't like how short this tube is, so this is going to be kind of an awkward project. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and fill this. You really want a longer tube and try not to splash it, so I'm going to let it just run down the side of the keg. I don't know why I cut this tube so short. That was my fault. Okay. There we go. Get a little better flow. And this is a, uh, I believe this was a pale ale I made, a um, pale ale with um, Cascade. Yeah, that's right. This was the uh, Sierra Nevada clone. Okay. Oh, that smells amazing. This is a lot easier than filling up bottles. <laughs> Trust me. All right, and we've got five gallons of beer there, about 4.75. There's a little bit of loss from the Trub collection. Any beer you spill on it, you do want to collect. It's clean up a bit so it doesn't get moldy. All right, so what you're going to do attach your lid and so with our kangaroo systems that you buy on our website um, it'll either come with a uh, five pound tank which is this guy here or it'll come with the 2.5 pound tank which is this even littler guy which is a lot more portable <coughs> the kangaroo system also comes with a regulator um, these are single gauge regulators. You can get dual gauge regulators as well where there's another gauge on there. This gauge just tells you how much is left in the tank, but unfortunately uh, tanks under 10 pounds don't really register on those gauges. So they're kind of pointless on the 5 and 2.5 pound tank, so single gauge is just fine. I do have the gas on. Okay. So what we're going to do is take one of our gas lines. I do have two gas lines on here using a distributor, which I'll show you in a moment. This goes on the inside. Okay, now before I do this, I should uh, let you know that be before you do this, you should make sure your beer is cold. So keg the beer, put the gas on, uh, turn it on, um, turn it up to, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, that's really high. Maybe 20, 30 PSI. And of course it's leaking from the lid so there's not a tight seal. There we go. You want to be sure you don't feel any air coming out. And you're going to go ahead and purge it. Just hold it for about 10, 15 seconds. That purges that oxygen space out of the top. You need to do this every time you keg your beer. Take that off. Then you're going to chill it overnight. You really need to have it chilled. Um, that's really important, and I'll get to that in a moment. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and get to that right now, since that kind of segues into it. Okay.
Okay, so Matt, if you want to throw up that uh, chart. Um, so Matt's going to be putting a chart on the screen. Uh, this is a carbonation chart. Um, I know it looks confusing, but I'll go over it um, for you fairly, fairly slowly. Um, so the left number is your temperature, and the top number is the PSI on your, your gauge, your uh, regulator. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, if you look at the table key at the bottom, you'll see blue will be undercarbonated. Anything 1.4 volumes of CO2 or lower is going to be undercarbonated. Um, uh, that goes for the white, too. I don't know why they didn't put anything. The, the whites should all be blue. Um, so the gray... Uh, those, those would be typically stouts and porters. They're typically lower carbonated. Um, green is going to be lagers, ales, ambers. Most beers, really. Most of your average beers are about uh, 2.2 uh, 2 to 2.5 um, atmospheres or volumes of CO2. Uh, the yellow is going to be your more high carbonated ales, such as lambics, wheat beers, um, saisons, things like that. And red can be either over carbonated or, um, or a higher carbonation for special, uh, certain specialty ales. Um, I know that there are some really effervescent beers. In, in fact, uh, um, Cooper's Australian Ale, um, sparkling ale, can, can, is pretty high up there. I don't think it's above four, but it's pretty high up there. Um, so 2.5 is average. When we do uh, our bottling for Mr. Beer Kits, I believe 2.5 um, volumes of CO2 is the amount that's added when you, when you follow the instructions with our sugar uh, to two, two teaspoons or two carbonation drops per, se per each 740 milliliter bottle or three quarter teaspoon for 12 ounce bottle, um, that will all get to about 2.5 volumes of CO2. But as you can see, with kegging, you can get extremely precise with your um, volumes of, of CO2. So basically, uh, let's say you're chilling your beer, which is typically gonna be about 38 degrees in a, in a normal fridge or chest freezer. Um, and so if you want it to be about 2.57, you'll see you want, it to have, you want it to be at about 12 PSI. So 38 degrees and 11 to 12 PSI for about a week will get you to that exact um, amount. Now, you can carbonate even faster. Um, you can carbonate overnight, basically. Um, you put your PSI up to 40. And, um, you know, of course, it's chilled at 38 degrees and let it sit overnight, after 24 hours, you should be 90% carbonated. Now doing this, is, you're not gonna get the exact precise levels of CO2, um, but you will be able to carbonate it faster. So say you have a beer that's not quite ready and you need to have it carbonated for a party or something, you can go ahead and do it that way. In fact, you can even carbonate your beer in, un, in, in under 10 minutes by putting it up to 40 PSI and putting your keg on the ground. You can uh, remove the thing if you haven't already, Matt. Um, and I'll post this uh, chart up on our, our forums, too, on the, the streaming thread. But, uh, okay, so you can do it in about 10 minutes, carbonate beer in 10 minutes, by um, um, putting your chilled kegs sideways on the ground, hooking the CO2 up about 40 PSI, and just rolling it, rocking the keg vigorously for about 10 minutes with your foot or your arms or whatever. Um, and it will carbonate. Now you got to let it sit for about 30 minutes for it to, to settle down, but it'll be carbonated. Um, it may be a little over carbonated or a little under carbonated, but that's, that's a really fast way to get your beer done in, in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, yes, as uh, Corthane is saying, kegs are amazing, but fair warning, if you don't have it at hundred percent clean and sanitized and instead of one bottle going bad, the entire five gallons are bad. But even that being said, I love kegging. The only thing I bottle now are meads. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the great thing though about stainless steel is that it is, it is easier to clean than plastic. Um, so if you, and if you scratch it on the inside, not gonna be as big of a deal as um, plastic um, because you can heat treat them, you can bleach them. Um, but I mean, it's really, 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 really hard to scratch the inside of these things to begin with. Um, and all the kegs that we sell on our website um, they are a little pricey compared to other kegs on the market, but we do sell the Italian laser cut kegs and they are the best in the world, hands down. Um, they're amazing and they will last you forever. You can buy used kegs anywhere from 30 to 60 bucks. Uh, typically you need to replace the gaskets. Um, sometimes you need to give them a really good cleaning. Um, if they ever held soda in them, then you definitely need to replace the gaskets because those gaskets will keep that soda flavor in there indefinitely and that can transfer into your beer. 
Um, so, so yeah, you can you can uh, keg it. So the, the best way to uh, keg and carbonate your beer is one week at uh, 11 to 12 psi at 38 degrees. Um, now this can can change depending on uh, the the style you're making, of course, or the exact carbonation level you want. Maybe you like a certain beer and you made a clone of it, but you didn't like that carbonation level. You can make it a little lower. Um, so. I mean, not only is it beneficial to keg because you don't have to fill up bottles anymore, but um, you can also, um, but it's also, it's easier to clean, sanitize one keg rather than a whole bunch of bottles. Um, and uh, they're, they're a lot more portable, I think. I mean, you can take bottles with you, that's cool and all, and, and, and bottles are great for giving out to friends, but don't forget, you can actually bottle from a keg as well. Um, the way to do that would be a counter pressure bottle filler. Um, you can buy basic ones for about 30 bucks online. Um, this is a really nice one. This one was about 400 bucks. It's a Warren's William counter pressure bottle filler. Um, you can fill the bottle directly from the keg, um, but you really should drink it within a couple weeks because there's a little oxygen gets in there and it can oxidize. Um, so it'd be similar as like filling a growler with beer. You fill a growler, you typically got to drink that within 24 to 48 hours um, or it can go flat or oxidize. With a counter pressure bottle filler, you're actually um, purging the bottle with CO2, getting the oxygen out, then filling it, and this reduces the foam because there's no foam happening if there's no oxygen in there. Um, and then you could fill it all the way up and, and cap it. It's pretty awesome. Um, I usually keg almost all of my beers, um, and I do fill bottles for like competition or for uh, friends or parties, things like that. Um, again, these are really, really handy. Uh, to have these little kegs, especially if you want to split a five gallon batch and maybe add like you're doing a stout and you want to add cocoa nibs to one and coffee to another. Um, <coughs> we also have uh, there are accessories for them like keg jackets. You can stick that in there, throw some ice packs in there. Um, they zip up, you, they have uh, armbands and handles. Um, and going from there, we're going to move on to the draft systems. Uh, the most common draft system you'll see people have their keg raters or their kegs in are keg raters, like this guy here. Uh, we do sell these. I really like these because they have the the brace on the back for the um, the tank and the regulator. These are really great keg raters. If you can afford one, I recommend picking one up. Um, now for your portable options, uh, you have what's called jockey boxes. And these can be built pretty inexpensively. I'll go ahead and bring this guy over here so you can see on this camera. As you can see, if you can see, is that camera working, Matt? There's a delay, so I can't see it. Okay. So we got a couple spigots. Um, so you can run two beers through here. And there are these stainless steel coils um, that uh, you run the beer through. And then you fill this with ice. And so the coils obviously... Uh, copper and then we have another jockey box I really like this this little guy super portable good for one beer isn't it cute it's our little mini ice cube jockey box and again that's probably about a 50 foot length of tubing there and you can fit a couple cans of beers in there too. <laughs> okay, and
so you can maintain it. And uh, as, um, oh, did we lose the audio? Yeah, I got it back though. Okay, are we good? Okay. All right, sorry guys. Um, and as uh, Cortain was saying earlier, we def you definitely want to take everything apart on these and clean them. And I'll quickly show you here. Open this little guy up. All right, we got our top off that joint off got our cap off and then this is the ball joint and it should be the piston I can move the box too okay that works and this this one's a little old I need to I haven't used this jockey box in a long time And so when you're putting it back in, you want to make sure that slot is facing the top there so you can get that, <clears throat> that little nib in there. And it's best to, um, if you don't use your keg grater a lot, you really should clean it after your keg is tapped. Um, don't just let it sit there and build up gunk. That stuff becomes what's called beer stone and it is very, very hard to clean off and it can infect future beers. Um, if you do drink a lot of beer and you have constantly beer running through your keg daily, then you really just need to flush your lines every so often. Um, but you really should take it all apart after maybe four or five batch, every four or five kegs you run. That's if you are drinking a lot of beer. Okay, um, some of the connections I'm going to go over. Um, so for these Cornelius kegs, as I was showing you, there are these uh, two connections, there's, and there's a black and a gray. The best way to tell is gray is always gas. So think G, gas. Um, and then the black is your liquid side. And then on here, on some kegs, especially used kegs, um, it, it, it might be hard to, to tell which one is in or out. Um, I know on the ones with the rubber handles, it gets rubbed off sometimes, or they might have it on paint, or you can't see it. Um, a trick to know which side is your gas, it's always going to be the side with the notches on the bolt. Every single keg is like this regardless of brand. So if you look at the liquid side, it's just a straight bolt. There are no little notches on there. Look, if you can see that well, Matt. Yeah, we can definitely see that. Awesome. And then the gas side will always have little notches on it. Okay. So those are your connections. Um, these are threaded. There are barbed ones, but we prefer to use the threaded. Um, that way you can add different size barbs for different size lines. And uh, an important note about lines I actually want to go over briefly, but I'm not going to get into it too much because there's a lot of math. Um, it's line resistance and uh, pressure. So your gas line is going to be like this red line I have here, it doesn't really matter the inner diameter of your gas as long as there's enough space. Um, this is a, uh, I believe a 3 8 um, gas line. The beer line, however, if you can see that, really, really small hole. Um, the, the proper length and diameter is gonna be 3 16 This is 3 16 inner diameter and about five foot. Um, you can't just put any line on and pour it because it might just foam too much because you have to have a balance between pressure of the beer from the PSI and resistance, which is the drag inside the, the line. So if your line is too short, um, it might be too foamy. Um, if it's too long, there might be too much resistance and it's not coming out fast enough. And again, it can be foamy. Um, so it's really important to have the correct size line and correct diameter. With that said, um, so this is our liquid post and you may see these are one quarter which is bigger than three eighths so the trick to putting these on to a larger you know putting it putting a large piece into a small hole put this in some boiling water for about a minute or two and it softens up really well and then you can really kind of work it in there um, 
With your beer line, because it's so tight, you don't really need a clamp, but I still recommend it uh, just in case, because last thing you want is that coming off and beer going everywhere. Um, and then a couple other tools. Uh, if, you, if you only have one tank, but you have multiple kegs, um, you can hook that one CO2 tank up and you can have a manifold. This is a two-way manifold. There are three-way manifolds, four ways. There are even really fancy ones that have extra gauges and you can, you can adjust the PSIs um, individually. Um, they're, usually, they're usually a secondary regulator, is what it's called. Um, in addition, when you're building these uh, jockey boxes with coolers and things like that, or if you're building a kegerator out of a full-size refrigerator or a chest freezer, um, you have what's called a, a shank. And this is for mounting to uh, fridges, um, coolers, and things like that. And, well, this one doesn't have the, oh, there it is. Okay. All right, so this can mount in through a fridge and then you have your, your little, uh, you know, that piece goes on there for, um, to kind of hide, hide the hole if you drill the hole in your, in your fridge or whatever. Get on there. There we go. So this is for mounting onto like a refrigerator that's really thick. And then you have different size ones. Uh, we got the, um, the four inch, four and eighth inch, and then we have a two inch one here for, you know, really, really thin, uh, uh, coolers and such um, and then there are like uh, drip trays you can add to your refrigerator there's all kinds of different ac um, accessories a lot of people really like to kind of make it a you know <clears throat> a hobby to build their own kegerator and custom to their you know their own style and preferences okay and uh, another thing I want to show you here is the this is really cool so you can also Turn uh, one of your taps on a kegerator, or you know your main tap, into a stout tap. And I'm sure you've seen nitro taps before, uh, with Guinness on nitro and such. Yeah, I knew that wouldn't go on there. It's a <laughs> uses a much longer um, tap tap uh, handle. But anyway, so this is a stout tap here for pouring stouts and such. Um, an important thing to know is that you don't use a CO2 tank with these. You use a, uh, a, a, a nitrogen, but it's not all nitrogen. It's CO2 mixed with nitrogen. It's usually a 40-60 mix, and it's known as beer gas. Um, the beer gas tanks, um, unlike regular CO2 tanks, which are male, the beer gas connections are female. So, um, so for your regulator, which is always female, you can either buy the nitrogen regulator, which just for that, or you can convert yours into nitrogen just by adding a female to male adapter. And now that'll fit onto a female um, nitrogen tank, which I don't have any here right now. I, I need to order some for the store. I mean, these are kind of expensive systems for the nitro, but if you make a really amazing stout, you've ever wondered what it's like to pour nitro, you can do it at home. Okay, so, as I was telling you, um, I believe this line, yeah, this is 3 16 Of course, it's not as wide as this. This is a 7 16 outer diameter. This is a 5 16 outer diameter, but that doesn't matter. All that matters is the, uh, the inner diameter. And this was actually a beer that I I poured yesterday. Right here. I put this in here yesterday, um, about this time. Well, just before the show, actually, yesterday's show. <coughs> and I put it up to 40 PSI um, after it was chilled. And uh, yeah, I chilled it, and then I, I put the gas on it yesterday. So in 24 hours, I had this almost fully carbonated. We'll see in a moment because I haven't actually had a pour out of it yet. Is it this one? Oh no, yeah, it's this one. That's the one I just did. I need to start labeling these things. Okay. 
So our PSI right now is about 30, or still at about 40, so I'm going to go ahead and lower that. Um, the knob on the front of your gauge is what lowers and raises your PSI. And that's up. Okay, so you'll need to re release the gas from the line and from the keg. I forgot this gauge was the, one of the ones that was kind of screwy. And now if you, if you carbonated your beer at 12 PSI for a week, that's the PSI you want to pour it at as well. I'm going to pour this at about 10 just in case because I did carbonate it overnight and didn't do the more precise week long method. And let's see how this guy pours. And this is the cheaper way to dispense your beer. This is uh, known as a Cobra faucet tap. Just a really generic tap, works great. Uh, it comes, this is kind of the complete system uh, you, you'll, you would get if you bought one of our um, kangaroo systems, uh, minus the uh, two-way manifold, of course. Oh, a little foamy at first. A little foamy. I'll turn the PSI down a little bit. Of course, I've been moving this keg around, so it might be a little bit shooken up, and that's probably why. Let's get the foam out of here. Okay. And this is my triple citrus pale ale. <clears throat> and the foam should calm down a bit too after you've done messing with it and haven't been moving it around. Um, but yeah, we got a pretty decent pour there. A little, little bit. Of, a little bit ahead. <clears throat> Great carbonation. So yeah, it's probably about 90% carbonated at this point. Um, but you leave it on the gas at that, at that pouring temperature, uh, or not temperature, PSI, 11 or 12 is typical. Um, <clears throat> then it'll be at about 100% in, a, in another 24 hours or so. <clears throat> Can you use CO2 with stouts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, CO2 is used with every beer. Um, you don't have to use nitro with stouts. There's no cold hard rule that says you have to. Um, CO2 is used for all the different beers. Um, standard. So yeah, it's uh, you can even use nitro. You don't have to use nitro with stouts either. I've had some really great cream ales on nitro. Um, I even had a couple IPAs on nitro, which was really interesting. Uh, especially the really... Uh, the the kind of they're starting to get popular uh, milkshake IPAs, which is like the hazy IPAs, but they add lactose and vanilla and usually some kind of fruit. Um, I've had those on nitro, and those are really interesting. Um, even coffee, people are starting to uh, to serve cold brewed coffee on nitro, which is which is really awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean kegging is really easy. You know, you just fill it up, um, put a little gas in there, purge it. Let it chill overnight. Um, next day, um, put the gas on, set it to your desired uh, PSI. If you need it within 48 hours, you can put it at 30, 40 PSI. Uh, come back the next day and check it. And it should be nice and carbonated. Um, if you want to have a precise carbonation level, um, which is recommended, especially if you are entering beers in competition or things like that, um, then you want to do it over a week at uh, 11 or 12 PSI at about 38 degrees, and that will get you 2.5 atmospheres of pressure. And of course, using that chart, you can, you can adjust that um, higher or lower if you'd like. Yeah, we do have good directions um, on the website. Um, I wrote them, so <laughs> I hope they're good. <laughs> Um, and hopefully this video kind of helps people too. So and we will have this up um, saved on our videos tab. So if you buy a kegging system and you need a recap and come back and watch, then this, this should be available for you to, to, you to uh, check it out. Um, does anyone have any other questions about kegging? I know I kind of went through everything a little faster than I anticipated. I thought it was going to take much longer, but I guess not. Um, oh, and really quick. Um, sanitizing the keg 
it's just it's going to be just like sanitizing anything else if you're using the no rinse cleanser um, like say for the 2.5 gallon or even the five gallon um, half of the no rinse cleanser and one gallon of water in here close it up shake it really good um, dump it out uh, you will also want to take off the uh, which I'll go ahead and do on this one You can see there's a dip tube in here with a gasket again you may need to replace these out every once in a while um, but taking all this off and sanitizing it um, really helps in addition to that well, let me see if I can use this guy you can also take apart your um, your uh, uh, oh I can't remember what these damn things are called the posts and I can't get it out but there's a little there's a little um, triangular thing in there you get like a little screwdriver pinhead screwdriver and you can kind of pop it out take the spring out and everything and then you can pop it back in with a screwdriver when it's clean you don't have to clean these again if you're if you always have beer running through it um, and you can also run sanitizer through it uh, you can take that that one gallon of sanitizer um, after you've shaken it up um, and then put your gas on and put your your uh, your spigot or your faucet on, and just run the gas, and it runs that sanitizer through your faucet, through your posts, and everything else. But it is still a good idea to take these off once every, um, you know, five to ten batches uh, to really deep clean them and keep that uh, the mold and um, any type of wild yeast or leftover yeast from a previous batch out. Um, oh, another really great thing about kegging. Uh, which really applies, oh, I forgot to put the dip tube back in there. I'll do it later. Um, really applies to um, um, like ciders and things like that. Uh, so say you wanna make a cider. Our cider kits, for example, when you make them, they come out a little bit more like a, a, like a dry English cider. You can't really add sugar to sweeten them because the yeast that you use in the bottles for carbonation will just eat that sugar, create more carbonation, and cause your bottles to explode. Um, now you could add more sugar and then close the bottles and refrigerate it really fast, but it's not going to be consistent. Um, it's not going to work very well. With kegging, since you're not using the yeast to carbonate your beer, you can use something like potassium sorbate or sodium benzoate, which are preservatives, preservatives that kill the yeast. And then you can add honey or sugar or whatever else to back sweeten it so you can have a sweet apple cider. Um, you can do this with sodas too, root beers, things like that. Um, since you don't, like our root beer kit, uh, typically uses a yeast to create the carbonation. Um, some people find that traditional way to be a little too bready flavor from the yeast. Um, I personally agree. Uh, it's not really my thing. So I personally like to um, keg my root beers um, in these kegs. I actually have a couple kegs dedicated just for root beer. Uh, because again, those gaskets kind of get dunked up with the root beer and you can't clean that off. Um, another thing I've seen people doing like sparkling meads, um, sparkling wine. Uh, you can even carbonate water, make sparkling water with this and then add whatever kind of flavoring you want, like some kind of homemade LaCroix if you want to. Um, kegging is great. It's really great. It's a lot, a lot better than bottling. Bottling is, is nice in that you have, uh, you know, you gifts you can give to friends. But again, you can bottle straight from your keg if you'd like and, and hand those out. Um, there's less uh, waste in packaging, um, less breakage with glass bottles. Uh, I could really go on and on and on about the benefits over bottling your beer. Um, so anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and close out the show. I think if I forgot anything, but I don't think I did. Pretty sure I went over everything. Um, another thing, really quick, actually, go ahead and pull this keg coupler out. So I'll show you the Sankey kegs. If you do have a keg rater, and sometimes you just want to go buy a keg of PBR or something, and your home keg rater is set up for a uh, For a um, a Sankey for regular or, or for homebrew, and you want to be able to run a Sankey tap. So.
So this is the typical top for this. It's a, it's, it's a, um, a barbed, but you can get ones that are threaded. Where did I put that guy? And put it on there on both ends. So we'll have one here and here and all of the connections on here are the same size. So you simply just got to take this off and screw this on really easy. That way you don't have to deal with the hoses. And that's why I prefer the barbed connections or the, the uh, threaded connections rather than the barbed. They do cost a little extra, but they're just so much easier to deal with. Okay. Do I like PBR? <laughs> um, honestly, not really. Um, I mean, you know, if I'm to compare it with Budweiser, Miller Coors, all the others, it's not that bad. It's, it's a little bit better. It's kind of a little bit cleaner flavor. I don't think they use as much adjuncts as some of the other ones do. Um, <clears throat> but as far as like, you know, low quality mass beer, um, I think I like Rainier a lot better. That, that's more of a Northwestern beer. Um, Rainier and then of course Olympia, which is now not made in Olympia. It's made in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <clears throat> um, how about aging beer? Yeah, you can absolutely age beer. In fact, um, the lock, stock, and barrel um, recipe that we have on our website, which uses oak chips, um, I do a variation where I actually use oak cubes. In fact, Matt, can you hand me that plastic uh, thing with the yellow lid? This one? Yes. So these are my oak cubes. And these have been soaking in whiskey for, I don't know, about a year. Uh, and bullet whiskey, rye whiskey. And so <clears throat> what I do is after my beer's all done, I'll put it into the keg, dump some of those um, um, cubes in there, purge it of oxygen, and then put it in my uh, um, cellar fridge. I have a, a, a floor a chest freezer that's um, at uh, 55 degrees for cellaring, 45 to 55 degrees. I put it in there and I let it sit there for three months to a year and just let it sit on those chips or the the cubes and it really mimics um kind of barrel aging so you can absolutely do that another thing people do um is use their uh keg as a fermenter um, especially as a secondary fermenter um once you go from primary you can fill it into here um and then there will be a, a special gauge you can get i cannot remember what, it, what it's called but it's a special gauge that goes on here, um, attaches to this black connector, or I'm sorry, the gas connector. No, yes, yeah, the black connector. And then uh, it, uh, it can regulate the pressure um, for your secondary. You can even do a primary under pressure. You can ferment under pressure, um, which is a really cool thing. And there's, there's, there are a lot of benefits to that. And I'll probably touch on that on another advanced show, how to uh, actually do that under pressure. Um, HL Roth, good to know. I just got that kit. Uh, which kit? Are you talking about the keg kegaroo? It if so, congrats. It's a really, really great uh, system. And it's customizable again. You can use your, you know, whatever size tank you want to get for it. Um, a thing about the tanks, about the CO2. Um, so to get them filled, uh, usually uh, homebrew supply stores will fill or, or exchange the tanks for you. Um, there are also places called like, like Air Gas, uh, Prax Air, um, a, lot, a lot of different places. Some welding shops will do it. There are even paintball shops that fill CO2 tanks or exchange them. Um, so there are a lot of different options for getting your CO2 refilled uh, locally. And typically for the five gallon or five pound tanks, um, for the little ones, it's usually about 10 bucks to fill them. Uh, the five pounds, about 15 bucks. And then you can get the 10 pound all the way up to 20 pound. We even have like a 100 pound tank back there that uh, I use. It's in between my chest freezers for carbonating stuff. Um, oh, the lock, stock, and barrel. Yes, awesome. Um, I think we were actually maybe talking about brewing that next week for our uh, intermediate show. Um, because I do want to do an episode on adding wood to, to beer and using wood in beer. Um, and I think that would be a really good recipe. And also, you know, I know it's not winter time and that's typically the time to drink stouts, but um, if you make that beer now, 
it'll be ready by winter and it'll be amazing. So that's really the way to, to go about it. All right, uh, let's see if I missed any questions from you guys. Looks like I didn't. If you guys have any more questions, go ahead and spit them out. I'm about to close out the show. Uh, next week, Tuesday, we'll be doing a um, another uh, beginner. Uh, Tim will be doing another beginner uh, show for you. I'm not sure exactly what we're doing yet, um, but I'm sure he'll have something good set up. Um, and I'm not sure what we're doing Wednesday or Thursday, but again, I really do want to do that lock, stock, and barrel or some kind of wood beer for you guys at some point to show you how to use wood in beer. Um, and I might even go over again uh, doing the uh, barrel barrel aging um, method in the kegs. Um, <clears throat> what is your favorite stout after LSB? Oh, what's my favorite uh, Mr. Beer stout? Ooh, probably the, um, the Calavera stout because I really like... Uh, chili beers and I'm really into those uh, mole stout beers that have been coming out with the spices and chilies it's such a good stuff in fact the calavera stout I loosely um, designed uh, off of um, stones uh, Chaco Vesa, which is a really really great stout with like cinnamon and, and ancho chilies and it's really nice <coughs> Kaiju Brew says, made Calavera twice, good stuff. It is, and what's also great is you can vary the the, the, the spices or the, the chilies you use. You don't have to go by the the, uh, the ingredients. That's just how I made it and how I liked it. Um, again, you can use anchos, you can use poblanos, um, chiltepins, whatever kind of chilies you want. And, uh, and yeah, also I wanna do that show because I want another excuse to make some more um, lock, stock, and barrel, because that is probably my number one favorite recipe of Mr. Beer. Um, it was one of the most challenging for me to make or to design, and it's also probably the most expensive recipe. But when you think about it, it's actually our cheapest recipe when you compare it to store-bought versions, because a you know a store-bought bottle of of you know like Kentucky Breakfast Stout, like a 22 ounce bottle, it's going to be about twenty dollars. Um, so when you figure, you know, the cost, I did it before and I think I figured it out to be about six to eight dollars per um, 740 milliliter bottle for a bourbon barrel aged stout. That is a really, really killer price. So I think that the lock, stock and barrel is not only our best recipe, but it's also our cheapest recipe when you think of it in terms of comparing it with the commercial equivalents um, on price. And with that, I am going to go ahead and close out the show. Um, if you guys do have any qu more questions or comments or concerns, um, scroll down under the screen uh, to the community and click on that. Register on our uh, community forums. We have a lot of really helpful people on there. Um, a lot of them come to the chats, including Kaiju Brew and a few others. Um, and there's, uh, we have a lot of different threads on every, pretty much every single brewing subject uh, dating back several years. Um, and we're, we're very active on there. You'll see me on there. You'll see Tim on there quite a bit. Uh, we do have a thread just for this stream. Um, so if you want to check out that chart, I will be putting it up um, on the stream uh, as soon as we're done here. Um, otherwise, you can always just Google um, carbonation chart or you know CO2 chart you know for kegging beer, kegging chart, however you want to look it up. And there are all kinds of different charts for that. Um, and also, if you want to go uh, learn about the keg line um, length, how I was talking about the lengths of keg, keg line and resistance versus pressure, um, there's a really great um, blog on beersmith.com. Um, it's called Keg Line Length Balancing, or just look up the science of draft beer. And uh, it's really great. Uh, Brad Smith wrote it, and uh, it, it points out, uh, has a little chart there about um, you know the size of tubing and how much uh, PSI per foot it has. And, and it sh tells you all the math to do this. There are also online calculators that tell you how to do that as well. So you can always check that out. It's not as, it doesn't have to be as complicated as I sometimes make it seem. Um, it is really, really simple. And if you have any questions about it, you can always give me a call here uh, at Mr. Beer, um, or you can give me a chat, send me an email, or hit me up on the forums. Again, I wanna thank everybody for joining us, and I will see you guys all next week. Cheers. Mm -hmm.